My name is Steve Staples. I'm the National Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Canadian Health Coalition. And I want to thank uh, our colleagues at uh, the University of Ottawa Center for Health Law Policy and Ethics for partnering with us on this really important research roundtable marking the 40th anniversary of the Canada Health Acts. Thank you very much for all your... We pay respect to the Algonquin people who are the traditional guardians of this land. We acknowledge their longstanding relationship with this territory, which remains unceded. We pay respect to all indigenous people in this region from all nations across Canada who call Ottawa home. We acknowledge the traditional knowledge keepers, both young and old, and we honor their courageous leaders, past, present, and future. So I hope you all have a copy of uh, the program for today. There's only been some minor changes. I think Natalie Stake, you said, is not able to join us today, um, but I think everybody else has uh, made their journey from across the country and wherever they live to, uh, to Ottawa to be with us uh, uh, for this session. Well, I want to point out that uh, rumor has it on good account that this is the only event in Canada marking the 40th anniversary of the Canada Health Act. And I have to say, we're, we're really impressed with all of the high caliber of thinkers and activists and everybody that are here. Now, to, welcome, to give us a, a welcome, just before we start our first panel, I'd like to hand it over to our new incoming Canadian Health Coalition chairperson and also secretary treasurer for the National Union of Public and General Employees, also known as NUPCHI, Jason McLean. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming to the research roundtable. Uh, the Canada Health Act at 40. This, as Steve said, is the only uh, event that great thinkers will be meeting and talking about the Canada Health Act and talking about healthcare in general for Canadians. That's both exciting and sad at the same time. We need more people talking about healthcare. And the way I'm looking at this event is we have such a high caliber amount of people attending and presenting that we are going to really kick off the conversation going into the next round of elections that will be coming up within the next year. As we all know, this is a very, very pivotal, pivotal time for uh, us in uh, social society, as I call it, uh, the labor movement and, and other organizations that really care about Canadians uh, to where this country is gonna be heading in the future. And I think it starts here with healthcare with us, expanding the Canadian Health Coalition uh, in the work that it does, and to be able to uh, make partners through and through in each province moving forward. Having said that, I do not want to take away from uh, the panel that we're about to come up, but I do want to uh, give a thank you to Pauline Orsford. Is Pauline here? Pauline is the outgoing chair of the CHC and uh, fastly becoming a great friend of mine that will soon block me because I'll be messenger her too much. So uh, thank you so much for the work that you've done, Pauline. And uh, as you and I have both talked, your work isn't done. So we're going to be doing a lot of work together as well. So just one piece of housekeeping before everybody uh, gets into the gets into the event. Uh, if If there's a fire alarm that goes off. Uh, we have a set of stairs around the elevators out here that go straight down. Also, there's a set of stairs uh, at the end of the hallway. And if you go out and turn left, you can get to those stairs, but also you can get to the washrooms if you ever need to go to the washroom today. I've seen a lot of you drinking coffee, so I'll give you about a half hour. So uh, thank you very much for coming, everyone. And uh, I really hope you enjoy today because I think this is a, a very important time for us. And uh, we're going to be able to move forward with a good report after this and make new friends and make new partners. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jason. I'll invite our first panel to come up to the stage, please. Very excited about this presentation. Um, first, uh, I think we mentioned to you how the 
simultaneous interpretation is working. You scan your phone. It's actually connected with the Zoom. This is a Zoom connection we're doing up here. And uh, we want to thank Mike for doing the sound system and, and all the visuals for us. Uh, he, he's tucked away upstairs there, uh, helping us out. Um, and uh, also to let you know, this is all being recorded. Okay, so we'll have this later on um, online for, for people to take part in. Uh, next, I want to hand it over to our, our uh, first, hand, first panel, the 2024 Canada Health Act Annual Report. And I think Mike can put up the, the deck for uh, Jennifer Goodyear. So that'll come up here in a second. I also want to mention that, uh, you know, um, I can't wait for Monday mornings. I'm a Monday morning guy because that's when the Hill Times comes out. <laughs> and I love getting the Thank Hill you. Times in my <laughs> inbox every Monday morning. And then after Monday, I just hang on until Wednesday because it also comes out on Wednesdays too. And then when I can, I get the special health report that Tessie Sa Sanchi uh, uh, puts together for us. And uh, we are delighted that she agreed to come and uh, moderate this panel. I'm gonna hand it over to Tessie. Thanks, Tessie. Also, we gave away free subscriptions to everybody. Yes. And you check your email, you get a free, if you're not already a subscriber, I would encourage you to check out your free one and then make sure, uh, make sure you get your uh, copy of the Hill Times every Monday morning, just like me, just like me. Thank you, Tessie. Yeah. We have a clicker for the slides? The clicker, yes, the clicker. Tracy, I see one coming up. It's like uh, the why price is right. Come yeah. on down. Thank you. So I'll just check volume in the meantime. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes. Great. Thank you so much. Um, oh, CHA 40? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. We're good with the clicker? Uh, I think that's it. I also have to mention that the Wi-Fi is UO-Visitor dash visitors so you'll see it and the password is there is no password so you can just use what it, just leave it blank and you can get you can uh, click right in and the hashtag today for uh x formerly known as twitter is hashtag cha40 canada health act 40 cha40 okay great take it away tessie uh, thanks, Steve, so much. And thank you, everyone, for being here. Thanks to the Canadian Health Coalition. I think I speak on behalf of all of us. Uh, thank you for inviting us. Um, as Steve mentioned, I do the health report at Hill Times Publishing. We are called Hill Times Health. And all we do is a deep dive into health, federal health policy. And I think that's really fitting today because we're doing a deep dive into the Canada Health Act, specifically for this particular panel, what the Canada Health Act is and is not. I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, there are experts uh, for the next 45 minutes. Um, Jennifer Goodyear is the executive director of the Canada Health Act Division at Health Canada, and her colleague Lee Whitman is assistant director of compliance and interpretation, also at the Canada Health Act Division. So the way the uh, panel will work is Jennifer and Lee have a presentation they'll provide us. Then I'm gonna jump into a few questions of my own, but we'd love to hear from you as well. So uh, please feel free to start brainstorming your questions. Um, so I will let you guys take it away. Uh, thanks, just making sure again, the mic's all good. Not loud enough. Not loud enough. If I move it a little closer, is that better? No? Mic's not on. Somebody else. Turn it off. Yeah, yes, check. There we go. How's that? I can actually tell because I can hear my own voice. <laughs> uh, so again, we wanted to also say thanks, uh, first of all, for having this session today. I, I think you are correct. This is the only CHA at 40 session across the country. So we're pretty excited to be here. It's a pretty rare occasion that they let us out of the Brooke Claxton building here at Tunney's Pasture. So uh, and it's good to do it on such a hot day on such a hot topic. So uh, thanks again to the organizers for that. Um, so it's also quite strange for us, I think, to be in a room where, A, everyone probably knows what the Canada Health Act annual report is, and B, perhaps some of you have even read the annual report or at least skimmed it, because I know it's a bit of a beast. It's about 400 pages this year, um, but we do put a lot of time and effort into that report, and so we're happy that 
some folks out there are actually turning to read it, which is great. Uh, so again, we're quite thrilled there's a whole day to discuss issues around the Canada Health Act, around Medicare, and around issues kind of um, related to Medicare as well. We actually have oh, more than half of our team here today, our small and mighty teams. So uh, they're here to listen to these discussions and uh, to engage in discussions as well. They do deserve a round of applause because they're an awesome team. Also super happy to see lots of familiar faces. We've been having a lot of discussions this past year on some of our upcoming policy work. So it's really great to see lots of uh, familiar faces in the audience who have been really helping you know, inform that upcoming work. So see if I can work the clicker. Maybe I can't. Oh, look at that. It's just a little bit delayed. Okay, so what are we gonna cover to, in today's presentation? Uh, so we were invited to come over and talk a little bit about the annual report itself, um, but we also wanted to take the time to describe how Health Canada administers the act, because again, our small and mighty team is the one that kind of lives and breathes the act on a day-to-day -day basis. And as we were sitting at the table with Tessie this morning, she was listening to like, you know, some reminiscence from, you know, 15, 20, 25 years ago, because a lot of the folks in our division have been there for a very long time some of them for their entire public service career. And I think that really speaks to how dedicated our team is to you know, protecting Medicare, upholding the Canada Health Act, the fact that a number of us have been there for you know, decades. And then finally, I'm guessing there's some curiosity about the upcoming and uh, current policy work that we're working on, uh, about you know, protecting that basket of services and maintaining that basket for now and into the future. Uh, so we're also gonna speak to that because again, you know, we hear lots of things about the act turning 40 this year. And I just want to note that as a product of the 70s, I do take some offense when we hear about it being old and past its prime as a product of the 80s. <laughs> so, you know, we think there's still lots of life left in the Canada Health Act, and I think we can have those discussions today. So with that, in my clicker, I will hand it over to Lee. Yeah, so let's talk about the report. You know that the Act requires us to table the report in the first 15 sitting days of Parliament each year. We'd probably do it even if we didn't have to, although maybe on a gentler timeline, um, because we think that it informs Parliament and Canadians on how their health system works, and it uh, is a great source, I think, of accountability. Uh, and we've provided a link in the PowerPoint slide, which I presume you'll have access to, or also on uh, the Health Canada website to the report. So if you want to. So on this next slide, um, we provide a quick overview of the structure of the report for those of you who are not familiar with it. And we'll discuss this in some detail later on, but the bulk of the report is actually made up of provincial and territorial narratives that describe their healthcare systems and they describe how they meet the requirements of the Canada Health Act. And um, we also in the report and in this slide are highlighting how most provinces or territories actually go beyond the requirements of the Canada Health Act by covering additional services that fall outside the Act's basket of, of services. So perhaps um, a recent example of that would be the fact that most provinces and territories have relaxed their eligibility criteria for people fleeing uh, the strife in the Ukraine. And uh, one on which I actually worked was uh, relaxing eligibility requirements for people returning home to Canada quite suddenly during the COVID pandemic, the early stages of it. And it was a very um, motivating, even though it was a horrible situation, it was a very motivating time because we literally were in meetings with the provinces while people were on airplanes heading for Trenton and to Vancouver. And the level of cooperation and sort of the, the goal-oriented aspect of that, I wish most Canadians could see and it might dispel some of their um, cynicism about the healthcare system and the people administering it. Um, but I think it, it's, a, it's a testament to the fact that we all share the same goals and we want uh, the people of Canada to enjoy the healthcare system that they pay for. So uh, chapter one of the act, or sorry, of the report, <laughs> um, really does provide kind of a legislative history of how the act came into being. So it kind of talks about the, how it amalgamated you know, two previous acts and then uh, also added in the extra billing and uh, user charges provisions. It also goes through an overview of the Canada Act itself and its five criteria and two conditions. 
And again, normally in a room, most folks wouldn't know what those five criteria are. And we could probably do a pop quiz and you might get one or two of them. But I know in lead up uh, to the session today, there was you know, actually individual sessions on each of the criteria, which is fantastic. And uh, we had folks listening in on those and it, it was really an engaging discussion. And so again, it's impressive to be in a room where folks actually know it. We think of it as CUPPA, you know, the C-U-P-P-A is how I always remember it for um, when I'm trying to do presentations on it. So again, those are the criteria and conditions that the provinces have to respect in order to receive their full Canada health transfer from the federal government. And one thing we notice a lot when we're reading articles about the Canada health transfer is it's often characterized as a unconditional transfer to the provinces and territories, but it's not. It's clearly um, connected to the Canada Health Act and respecting those criteria and conditions. And it's always been conditional on respecting those criteria and conditions. Um, I know we have some of our justice colleagues here today, and they often cite the Canada Health Act as a gold example of using the federal spending power in an area of provincial and territorial jurisdiction. And that's essentially because the act doesn't overreach and it's not too prescriptive. And that's pretty a key component is that we can't be too prescriptive in an area of provincial and territorial jurisdiction. The act also applies at the plan level of a provincial or territorial healthcare plan. And again, it's intentionally broad so as not to encroach on that provincial and territorial jurisdiction. I'm gonna have a hard time not saying PT, so excuse me. And this allows really the provinces and territories that flexibility they need to introduce their own you know, legislative or regulatory requirements to meet the requirements of the act. That being said, it's important to note at the end of the day, uh, technically the Canada Health Act is a voluntary thing. The provinces and territories could choose not to adhere to the criteria and conditions, but if they did so, they would risk forfeiting some up to all of their Canada health transfer from the federal government. Uh, so a good example of that in recent years would be the, um, the government of New Brunswick. New Brunswick has a regulation on the books that makes it so abortion services are only provided or only covered when they're provided in hospital. They had had one clinic that was providing these services uh, to individuals in the province, and they had to charge the individuals or offer them pro bono. It was not a viable um, business model, and, the, and that abortion clinic unfortunately had to close. The province has been taking deductions for that for a number of years, but they've been clear that they're not going to be changing that amendment. They're going or their uh, regulation and amending it. Uh, that's just they think they have enough access to abortion uh, in the province through their hospitals. And so that's their choice. They're taking this deduction on a yearly basis and they, they will continue to do so if, if that clinic had stayed open. They'll take another couple of deductions given how the reporting cycle works for the Canada Health Act. But again, in that case, the, the clinic did close and that, that access to care uh, for the abortion services is now only in hospitals in New Brunswick. But I, I do think just picking up on that one point that Lee had mentioned on the last slide, I think it is important to know that in general, all provincial and territorial um, Legislation does mirror the Canada Health Act, and oftentimes it does indeed go beyond it. So another thing that we have in our an annual report, and this is something that we added just a couple of years ago, actually, is a, um, a couple of myth busters. And we did this because uh, in the Canada Health Act division at Health Canada, we get a couple, you know, sometimes up to a couple hundred pieces of correspondence a year. We still get voicemails into our, our, our landline that we still have um, with Canadians asking questions. And in some cases, those are legitimate concerns. Someone thinks they've been charged inappropriately. We ask them to give us a consent form. We follow up with the provinces and territories. And most times, you know, we solve that issue for them. Sometimes it's not a Canada Health Act issue at all. And we end up, you know, just kind of myth busting for them and explaining how it's not a Canada Health Act. And then we have a whole other pile, I think we were talking about this morning at our table, that is dedicated to individuals who complain about parking at hospitals being a barrier to care, because that's a lot of correspondence that we get is about the high cost of hospital parking. Uh, so I know there's another presentation on the myth today, so we're not going to go through all the ones that are in the report, but I am going to flag the first one on this slide. And that's that all the myth that all healthcare in Canada must be publicly delivered. And I think folks think that because of the public administration criteria or criterion in the act, but it's uh, not true. Uh, the, the fact is that private delivery is not contrary to the Canada Health Act, but what is contrary to the act is private payment. And so there is a difference and we often see the two conflated sometimes uh, in articles about the Canada Health Act. My colleagues are probably going to giggle because I bring this one up every time, but I'd like to highlight the, the myth that Canadians don't need health insurance when they travel inside the country. 
but it's one that I take to heart. Uh, you know, we have reciprocal agreements in this country, and those are between provinces and territories. They're not, they don't involve the federal government, except that we provide a secretariat function for the committee that arranges those. And so that means if you need urgent care at a hospital in another province or territory, you can simply uh, show your your home province's healthcare card. And that's also true uh, for physician services, except for residents of Quebec, uh, because Quebec didn't sign uh, that agreement. And incidentally, these agreements, I think, are an example of PTs exceeding the requirements of the Act. Uh, in the interest of the residents. The act requires that residents retain coverage when they travel, but these agreements mean that they don't have to uh, pay for their care and seek reimbursement when they return home. But nonetheless, there are a number of services that are highly subsidized for residents of a province or territory that are not subsidized for visitors, even if they're from another Canadian province. And so the best example of that is ambulance care. Um, if, if we needed to call an ambulance for somebody today and they were an Ontario resident, it would be a, a fairly nominal amount. Um, but if it was for somebody visiting from another province, it would probably at the least be $1,000. And so my public service announcement to you today is please get health insurance when you travel. Take or take it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but the next slide, uh, we're going to talk about the second federal chapter of the report, which describes how we administer the Canada Health Act. And I can tell you that we monitor issues through engagements with province engagement with provinces and territories. And by keeping an eye on public sources like the media, uh, college websites, uh, PT websites, we hear things at conferences like this, frankly. Uh, and we also hear directly from Canadians who describe their experiences in the healthcare system. And for the majority of, of issues, as Jen intimated earlier, engagement with provinces and territories is sufficient to resolve them. And frankly, the public doesn't hear about those issues. There are an extraordinary number of, of issues that are uh, solved behind the scenes. And, and I'd like to say that even when provinces and territories aren't offside the Canada Health Act, but there's a situation, uh, they work diligently with us to resolve that situation. And so as an example, and, and won't give you too many of the specifics, but uh, recently had a piece of correspondence from somebody who'd moved from one province to another um, and didn't register for the provincial health insurance program um, for whatever reasons, maybe life was busy, uh, but a year later became ill, needed hospitalization, needed care. Um, that province could have required the individual to wait out a three month waiting period um, the previous province would not have been required to provide coverage because that's for the first three months after you leave your province, it's meant to bridge. But in the case where somebody hasn't registered for the insurance plan, we have a problem. We have expensive care and a medical need. And I can't tell you how many times we've worked with provinces and territories to help um, mediate that situation. And in almost every situation, the province or territory has backdated coverage. So, you know, we're issuing coverage today, which is June 20th, but we're going to backdate it to the day that you arrived in this province as a kindness and because we share the same goals. So I think that CHA administration can seem antagonistic in the media at times, um, but collaboration is actually key to at least the work that we do um, in trying to ensure that Canadians have the access to the care they need. And it's especially helpful because it might surprise some, actually probably not in this room, uh, it would surprise some other people to know that we don't have direct investigatory powers under the Canada Health Act. We can't, you know, with, with the staff we have, rage into a clinic and say, open your books, we have to, to have a look. So we rely a great deal on the cooperation of provinces and territories, and, and we receive it, frankly. Um, some of you might be aware of the Marta Loop Clinic, which was in uh, Alberta, is in Alberta, um, but it started a subscription style service where people were going to have to pay monthly. And it appeared that it was a bundle of services, and this is quite common. Um, the claim was that the, the fee, the monthly fee or the annual fee was for uninsured services like um, physiotherapy or, you know, things that aren't insured under the Canada Health Act, at least. 
but we suspected that access to insured services was contingent upon paying that fee. And whether it was or it wasn't, it certainly appeared so looking at the website of the clinic. And so we got in touch with Alberta, who I can assure you was already on it. Um, and they moved very quickly to um, have the clinic clarify that paying annual fees or monthly fees was not a requirement of receiving insured care at the clinic. And that's just one story. So while Lee is correct and most of our issues really are dealt with at the officials level, our, we, you know, we are very busy as a, our management team in the, in the division, as well as all of our analysts kind of building that rapport and building those relationships with our provincial and territorial colleagues. We have you know, monthly discussions with most of them. Um, that being said, uh, sometimes that collaboration does indeed reach an impasse. And then when there are there is clear evidence that patients are being charged for an insured service, it gets escalated to the minister and then Canada Health Act um, deductions are levied to the transfer payments. So chapter two also uh, outlines the compliance and um, actions as well as the dedu deductions to the provinces and territories all the way from 1984 up to March of 2023 in this last report. And the March 23 report, or the 20, March 20, sorry, February 24 report, talking about the March 23 redu deductions um, was a pretty important one for us because it also included the very first deductions levied under the diagnostic services policy. And for the, those that aren't aware, uh, who haven't looked through the report, that policy was issued in 2018, but didn't come into effect until April of 2020. And again, because we have very complicated reporting timelines, um, that meant the provinces and territories had to report to Health Canada in December of 2022. And then those reports informed the March 2023 deductions. And so those deductions were about $76 million in March of 2023. And those were all for direct patient charges for diagnostic services. Now, what the report doesn't cover, uh, because again, complicated timelines, <laughs> uh, we were tabled the report in the first 15 sitting days, which usually ends up being, you know, February-ish, mid-February. And yet we take our deductions in mid-March. And so it always misses the next round of deductions. So what's not included in the report, uh, but we did release in a statement in March, was that in the March 2024 round of deductions, another $79 million was deducted, again, for direct uh, patient charges to patients for insured services. And again, the majority of those deductions were uh, for diagnostic services. And since 2015, just to let you folks know, uh, about $267 million has been deducted from provincial uh, health health transfers. So the other thing uh, that's outlined in chapter two are some of the other compliance issues that either have resulted in deductions or that we're working uh, you know, collaboratively through with the provinces and territories. Uh, so one of those I already mentioned, the abortion access in New Brunswick, but there's also been some abortion access issues in Ontario where they've been taking deductions uh, for, they don't charge for the service, but they charge for some of the, the you know, they charge a fee for the care around the service in some abortion clinics in Ontario. So we've been working with them to kind of eliminate those charges. Uh, there's been a longstanding, I'm sure many of you are well aware because of the Canby case of private pay uh, surgical clinics in British Columbia. Uh, that province, you know, they were kind of hindered there for a while with the, uh, you know, the injunctions and the Canby case going through the court, but it came to its rightful conclusion. And um, that, that province is really working to really kind of eliminate those surgical uh, service, uh, surgical fees. And then the other one that's kind of coming up, and Lee alluded to this one, and this one's coming up a lot. It's a little bit like, um, we call it like whack-a-mole when we're talking with our provincial and territorial colleagues. And that's these like membership fee clinics or executive health clinics where you pay a subscription fee or a monthly or annual fee to access care. And I think we're going to talk about those a little bit later, but they are kind of a like working in a bit of a gray area. And I think that's part of the issue with some of the things in the Canada Health Act. It is a very you know short act, which does leave some room for gray areas. And so that's when we try to kind of close out those gray areas. We kind of try to close down those loopholes when we can. And so then again, as we said, most of our um, efforts in the last couple of two years, I guess, have really been working on implementing that diagnostic services policy. And we've been you know, engaging with our provinces and provinces. in this case, it's just the provinces that have taken uh, deductions for those services. Um, but since that March of 2023, those initial deductions and with you know lots and lots of discussions with our provincial colleagues, uh, they've, many of those jurisdictions that took deductions have taken steps to eliminate those charges to kind of crowd out the, the private payment and uh, also while improving access to their residents as well. 
So for example, British Columbia purchased a number of those private clinics and then rolled them into their public system. And then they've also kind of sent cease and desist letters to the clinics that are providing insured services to not charge for any other uh, medical uh, necessary diagnostic scans in their, in their clinics. Also quite notable would be uh, Manitoba. So Manitoba had a clinic that was charging for ultrasounds and echocardiograms. They took their deduction in March of 2023. And then, you know, we, we talked to them and said, you know, we can, well, well, not to steal your thunder, there's something about coming <laughs> with reimbursements coming up. They uh, sent cease and desist letters to that clinic. It has since stopped charging patients for those services. Yeah, and so as Jen has alluded to, um, there there is a reimbursement policy under the Canada Health Act that's new since 2018, um, because the goal of Canada Health Act administration is not to find the most deductions we could possibly make to provinces and territories. Our goal is to mediate situations where there are access problems, and when provinces and territories have worked together with us to do that, it doesn't make sense to us to keep subtracting money from their healthcare systems. And so in 2018, Mr. Uh, Minister Petipa Taylor at the time announced the reimbursement policy among some other initiatives we'll mention later. And so if, if a province has been deducted due to patient charges, they have up to two years to work with us to eliminate the patient charges and the circumstances that led to them. Um, and if they do that, they qualify for full reimbursement of the deduction. If they work toward it and make some tangible progress, um, they are also eligible for partial reimbursement. Um, and, and Jen mentioned already some of the provinces and territories that have had uh, reimbursements under the policy. We've, so far, we've reimbursed $175 million in um, deductions, and we see that as a win uh, for Canadians, but you can read more about it in Annex D of the annual report. So we've talked about compliance under the CHA, but what about thinking forward? You know, what, what's coming up? Well, as you may know, the federal government is investing significantly in our healthcare system through a series of bilateral agreements with provinces and territories. Um, but Health Canada is working to build on the foundation provided by the CHA by expanding access to services that fall outside of it. The creation of dental care, the laying of foundations of pharmacare, and developing safe long-term care legislation are all examples of this important work. But at the same time, we're focused on implementing policies that preserve the fundamental basket of services that was in place when the Canada Health Act was enacted in 1984. So in the past, uh, when new means of delivering uh, healthcare services had undermined the basket of services insured under the Act, um, federal ministers of health have issued interpretation letters to clarify the Act's intent and application. And so, uh, for instance, the Marlowe letter in 1995 um, was meant to address patient charges in private surgical clinics where the plan was paying the medical fee, but patients were being charged a facility fee for the services around, or for the things they were receiving around the service, like uh, the sterilization of uh, instruments and that sort of thing. Uh, I've already, or we've already mentioned the Petipa Taylor letter in 2018, um, which put into place the diagnostic services policy. It also put into place the reimbursement policy, which we've just talked about, and uh, strengthened reporting under the CHA. So our annual report, we think, is a bit more substantive than it used to be. Um, but speaking of interpretation letters, uh, provinces and territories have acknowledged the minister's authority to interpret the act, and courts have acknowledged the use of these letters in the administration of the CHA, most recently in the Canby case. So these uh, next few slides are really about the policy work that's kind of keeping us uh, most busy uh, these days or keeping us up at night sometimes or weekends and all that kind of fun stuff. And I know, again, this is where we've had lots of discussions with some folks in the room about this, what's going to be an upcoming interpretation letter. Um, and I'm going to flag her because she's sitting in the audience. We have Marcy Gillespie as the um, assistant director for the policy side of our division. And so she's the one who kind of spearheads all the interpretation letter work. So you can seek her out later and ask her questions. <laughs> Um, but uh, as Lee said, the last two interpretation letters really dealt with kind of the where. Uh, so it's when services migrated outside of, you know, the big H hospital. But again, as we said, the act 
does have some gray areas still and some loopholes that at this point we need to close. And there are issues around how care is being delivered now and then who is delivering that care. Um, so in recent years, and particularly since the onset of the pandemic, which really kind of resulted in its um, explosive and widespread adoption, the emergence of virtual care has shown it does have the potential to really help um, increase access to care across the country, particularly for rural and remote Canadians. But at the same time, we're also hearing lots of reports of Canadians paying to access that care. And that same care would be covered by a provincial or territorial health care plan if it was provided for in person. And similarly, uh, while well, we have virtual care on the one side, kind of looking at the how care is delivered, the who's ca delivering care is also changing quite a bit. Um, expanding scopes of practice for other regulated health professionals like nurse practitioners, midwives, pharmacists, have really kind of changed that landscape of who can deliver some uh, services, but that back in 1984 could only have been provided for by a physician. So it's not all services that we're looking at provided by these other regulated professionals, but it's really where they kind of overlap in that Venn diagram of things that, you know, back in 1984, only a physician could have provided to its uh, to a patient. And again, this has great uh, potential to increase access to care for Canadians. But at the same time, we're hearing, and there's lots and lots of media reports about this, of, you know, you know, a nurse practitioner hanging out a shingle and, and charging patients to access care that, again, would be provided uh, coverage for if it was provided by a physician. So again, this kind of harkens back to that, you know, maintaining that basket of services. And um, again, the, we're, we're very excited by these innovations that are in help, happening in healthcare delivery. But Health Canada really thinks that if there's an innovation in healthcare delivery, it should really be to the benefit of all Canadians, not just those get, that can afford to pay for those innovations. And so that's uh, why back in March of 2023, our former Minister of Health, Minister Duclos, wrote a letter to his provincial and territorial colleagues. He also posted that letter online in a statement really kind of outlining his concerns that there are services that if provided for, you know, in person or by a physician, we're now kind of being charged to Canadians to access that exact same care. And he was very clear in that letter that he was going to be issuing a new Canada Health Act interpretation letter that would address those patient charges. But he first asked us to talk to the provinces and territories and engage and consult on what that letter would look like in terms of, you know, how they could implement it into their systems. And then more recently, Minister Hollins confirmed this intent about issuing a CHA interpretation letter uh, on virtual care and physician equivalent services. And really, again, just kind of clarifying the Canada Health Act, you know, modernizing the act uh, in a way that keeps pace with some of these new innovations in healthcare delivery. Um, and again, he has said that that letter is uh, coming soon. And again, we, we continue to have, you know, multiple discussions with our provincial and territorial colleagues on this one. So I think, unless you have anything else you want to add, no, <laughs> I will uh, conclude there and say, like, I think we're, you know, from our perspective, yes, we recognize that the act is 40, but I think we can all recognize 40 is not all that old. Um, and it, we think it does very much remain relevant to Canadians. Those principles that it represents really are at the heart of our healthcare system. They really have laid that foundation that Canadians expect of the healthcare system. And we do have those tools that can help us modernize the act. And now we're looking forward to hearing some questions from both Tessie and the room. What wonderful. Thank you all so much. And um, I hope the Canada Health Act isn't old because we almost share a birthday. <laughs> <laughs> so that tells you something. Um, okay. Can I get a sense of how many questions are in the room? There's at least one, two, three, four, five. Okay. There's quite a few. I'm going to cut my questions in half. Okay, because I'd really like to get that out, uh, you know, the mic into the room, because we definitely have folks who want to chat. So, um, <clears throat> but let's, I would like to start off with probably the most obvious question, which is the gray area. And it connects to the work you're doing right now. You know, as much, Lee, you were talking about kind of a conversation with Alberta about a particular clinic, but there's still numerous other clinics, right? And there's still the virtual care that's happening in provinces that don't cover publicly virtual care. And, um, you know, it could be one person having pneumonia, going to a doctor who bills the province, 
that same person having pneumonia going to the virtual care provider in a province that doesn't cover it. And basically how that's paid for depends on where you go. So can you provide a little more detail from the perspective of the legislation about how those private clinics and private, excuse me, private providers are allowed to operate? Sure. Um, I think people in this room would agree with me that the operators of private clinics in Canada are becoming increasingly savvy about how to navigate healthcare legislation in a way that doesn't put them offside. Um, and so, for instance, um, in the, you know, here's a good example. In British Columbia, um, there was a private clinic that was charging a subscription fee. Um, there's a very activist government there watching the healthcare system. They intervened, um, said, you know, your, your practices aren't clear on your website. And people can't receive expedited care to physician services uh, by paying a fee, either for preferential or, or you know, for any access. Um, that clinic pivoted to using nurse practitioners, which at this point in time are not um, captured under the Canada Health Act interpretation. So there's that sort of uh, navigating, I would say. There are, I think, clinics um, charging, especially in the virtual world, charging across provincial borders and the prohibitions against extra billing and user charges, even if it was an insured service apply out to residents. So charging someone from another province um, is also a way that they navigate that. I'll connect this question um, to another question I wanted to ask about the current work you're doing on the upcoming interpretation. Feel free to let us know when that's coming out, because I'm sure everyone would be interested. Um, but your presentation said you're engaging with provinces and territories on this. What are the questions you're asking? What is the information you're trying to gather in order to build this updated policy? I'll start. <laughs> So I think with any interpretation letter, the only we we save them for kind of like seismic shifts in healthcare delivery. So um, we recognize it means there's been a big leap in something, and that's why we need to have an interpretation letter to kind of keep the act current. And so I, I'm just thinking back to like the Petty Paw Taylor letter, which dealt with diagnostic services. Technically, and in hindsight, we probably should have included diagnostic services in the clinics policy in 1995. We didn't at that time because there was only, I think, three private clinics offering diagnostic services. It wasn't really an issue, but we didn't think far enough ahead, realizing that that's going to be a problem in the future. And so then, you know, we've learned from that lesson now with this upcoming interpretation letter, and we're trying to figure out with the provinces and territories, what else is coming down? You know, what else is on the horizon? What other new, you know, modes of delivery should we, you know, try to look at and could be exploited in terms of uh, charging patients? Then at the same time, we also have to ensure that the provinces and territories can kind of pivot to ensure that they can, they're going to have to change some legislation. They're going to have to change their regulations to meet the requirements of the act if we do have this interpretation letter out there. And that takes time. Uh, you know, you, we work for the government. Everything seems to take, you know, a lot longer than you were originally going to be thinking. So um, and it's the same thing with the provinces and territories. They're going to have to change legislation. They're going to have to change potentially, uh, you know, fee schedules, billing codes. All that takes time to put into the healthcare system. So with the Petty Paw Taylor letter, which I kind of alluded to with that kind of timeline, the letter was issued in 2018. We put an effective date of April of 2020. So they had a kind of a two year, a little bit less than two years to adapt their systems. And that's when they started to accrue those patient charges, which they're now being levied against. Um, we were kind of hopeful that they would have them kind of dealt with by the time the letter came into effect, but they needed more time. So I think that's something that's, again, yeah. a lesson learned for this upcoming letter. And I would just throw in, you know, given that we put it in place in 2018, it came into effect in 2020, there were still some patient charges accruing. As Jen says, they don't get deducted for another two years after the effective date. They still had time to align their systems with the requirements of the act and be eligible for immediate reimbursement. So there's a lot of time, I think, given uh, to PTs to, to make those changes. And I would say some of them actually are already making those changes in both the world of virtual care and with um, other physician providers. So there's been a kind of a host of announcements over the last about year and a half of individual provinces kind of going forward with even without an interpretation letter. Some have asked us for it. I think you may have seen in the media that the Ontario minister wrote to our minister saying, you know, get that letter out. We, we need to have it to deal with nurse practitioners. Um, and that played out in the media, I think, last month. Uh, and others have kind of gone ahead without the letter. I think in Alberta, they've just kind of rolled out a new nurse practitioner model. So the, some of them are moving ahead without us as well. Um, let's also pick up on the language in the bill. 
I've been covering health since 2017, 2018, and I'm used to reporting on an act to amend the et cetera, et cetera. Um, but this bill is pretty much the language as it is now is what it was in 1984, correct? Close. Yeah, There's pretty few inconsequential amendments. Yeah. Um, so why is there such a reluctance to amend the Canada Health Act, especially in the context of, I know we were discussing this yesterday, we hear a lot of why isn't such and such included in the Canada Health Act? So why is there this reluctance? Sure, I'll start. Um, I think the Canada Health Act really, uh, we, you know, we've recently been talking about it. It creates the foundation of the healthcare system. It's not the ceiling of what provinces and territories could choose to ensure. And um, in, in many cases, there isn't a need um, to amend the Canada Health Act, uh, you know, to move forward with uh, even national standards. And you see that recently through the bilateral agreements. Um, but we also are, are playing this dance, dancing this dance of not dipping too far into provincial and territorial jurisdiction. We, we, we can talk about principles like accessibility and portability, uh, but once we reach too far in, um, you, you're really at risk of challenge. I would think there's also there's kind of concerns about losing what you already have. And so I think mm. oftentimes the better answer is instead of amending the Canada Health Act is to have kind of sister legislation, which would mirror the, you know, the principles and the good components of the Canada Health Act that you want to see for other areas of health care. Um, so we are at 942. I'm looking at Steve. Can we do five minutes of questions? Would that be OK? All right, folks, there is a mic over there. This is where I turn it over to you and you do some of my homework. So please feel <laughs> free. Uh, go right ahead. There we go. Testing. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Very interesting. Uh, my name is Kevin Skerritt. I'm involved with the Ottawa Health Coalition, affiliated to the Ontario Health Coalition. So we follow your work and uh, these issues very, very closely. And my question uh, really is zeroes right in on the issues you were just discussing about uh, the expansion into nurse practitioners uh, and, and related. But specifically, I guess we have a case uh, from right here in Ottawa, uh, which has uh, achieved some profile. I'm sure you've heard of it. Uh, it is a clinic called the South Keys Health Center uh, in the southern part of uh, Ottawa, which introduced last October uh, a new membership subscription fee, $400 a year, to get specifically access to a nurse practitioner with the explicit promotion that the nurse practitioner service would provide prescriptions and other family physician services. So, and of course, uh, you know, we consider this, we as uh, activists in the Ottawa Health Coalition and advocates for public health care, interpret this to be a violation of both the Canada Health Act and the Ontario equivalent statute. And I, I guess hearing your presentation, it just focuses my attention on the definition of an insured service. Mm -hmm. For people that don't know, uh, nurse practitioner's scope of practice, as I think you said in your presentation, was recently expanded to permit them to carry out more family physician services, including prescriptions. But the Ontario government did not provide funding for that service. And so in practice, this clinic and I think others are starting to say, well, great, uh, Ontario government's not funding it. Therefore, we interpret this to be not an insured service. My view, I think uh, for many of us advocates, we consider this to be an insured service. And so charging for it, regardless of who's providing it, is a violation. And I guess even having heard what you've said, I would like your response to that uh, particular equation, because I think this will catch on like wildfire if we do not put a stop to it. And I think it's that last point that's really our biggest concern. Like we don't want it to catch on like wildfire. And essentially that is why, you know, the ministers, the successive ministers have said that they are, they have significant concerns about these, this practice of nurse practitioners charging for services that would indeed be covered if provided by a physician. And so that is why they, they you know, they have indicated they want this letter to get out soon because it does essentially change. And it, with these services, once that letter is out, would be considered insured services under the Canada Health Act. And they would not be allowed to charge for those services. 
Um, and I think the big concern is, and why the letter needs to come out soon, and that's what the minister has indicated will happen, is because he's been clear he doesn't want these charges to become entrenched in the system. And again, it's a bit of a lessons learned from that diagnostic services policy, right? Like we could have dealt with it in 1995, didn't think it was necessary. I think I told you there was three in 1995. By the time we dealt with it in 2018, someone from my team could probably show the number, like over 40, 68, thank you, <laughs> 68. So it went from three to 68 by the time we dealt with it. And that's not what we want to deal with here. And I think this is also something that could balloon a lot faster than diagnostic services because you don't need to pay for an MRI machine in your private clinic to have a nurse practitioner open up a practice. I don't know if you want to add anything to that. No? Okay. Go right ahead. Uh, thanks. So I'm, I'm trying not to load this all on you because as you say, it's a small and mighty team and uh, you know you are there to to deal within the bounds of the legislation as it currently exists. It's 40 years old. It's not proving capable of pushing back against provincial governments that want to use the loopholes, let alone private uh, entities that want to expand public health care, okay? So we know that um, can be, uh, you know, uh, it, it was great. It was uh, a victory, but at the same time, we've snatched defeat through COVID, through the expansion of virtual through what's what Ontario is doing, what legislation in Alberta is doing. Uh, we are getting pushed back as public health advocates. Uh, and it's not even incrementally. Now it's just full force attack. And what your team is doing, as good as, as it may be within the bounds, uh, is, is not enough. Um, so I don't know if I can ask you this, but we need more uh, I don't know if it's regulation or another act. We need to strengthen the Canada Health Act. There's lots of loopholes in it. And, you know, what, what is medically necessary services? Who decides that? Uh, you know, you can use your health card, but not your credit card. Well, that's all well and good, but it's still privatization here in Ontario. And I'll take um, one note to, to Lee to say, you mentioned an activist government in BC. It wasn't the activist government in BC that, that took the action. It was the Medical Services Commission. So in BC, they created something that, yeah. that is longstanding, goes beyond uh, whatever flavor of government is in place to, to uh, act in the best interests of the act and of the people of BC. Other provinces need that. And frankly, the federal government needs that. <clears throat> we need an arms, we need something that oversees the political aspects of the of these acts because it has been politicized and the federal government has been taking a step away from this for a long time. Okay. It doesn't want to get into a fight with the, the provinces and the provinces want to pick a fight with the federal government. And we all lose in that scenario of um, passing the buck and everyone finger pointing, but no one taking action. No real question in there. Maybe there is about, you know, I would ask you, I'm not sure you'll answer this, but what can be done with the Canada Health Act that we can strengthen within the bounds that you have now? Where do you feel frustrated with not being able to go further to try to protect Medicare? Thanks. Well, first of all, sorry about the Medical Services Commission. You're right. Um, I would say if if I could um, accomplish time travel, that'd be great. Um, I might go back to 1983 when the act was being drafted and give stronger investigatory powers. Um, and I might also have... And this is just speculative. I'm a public servant. I'm not trying to undermine the government. Um, but I also would have removed um, deductions or, or penalties to an arm's length organization, maybe a bit like the Medical Services Commission, uh, to depoliticize the process um, because it, it occurs in a landscape of lots of FPT priorities. And I think I would just add to that that I do think even a small deduction sometimes can have the intended con or intended action. So sometimes the provinces take very small deductions. Newfoundland was taking a deduction for a, um, a cataract surgeon that was charging patients. It was tiny, $140,000, I think, maybe yeah, $140,000. But they fixed that problem because of the deduction and that they didn't want to be named in the Canada Health Act annual report. So there is still kind of that moral suasion component that we do have, not just with like the stick of the deductions, but the fact that they don't want to be shown to not providing this care for their residents. And so I think even the fact that so many of the provinces that took deductions for diagnostic services have started to kind of, you know, make changes in their in their um, provinces to, you know, 
eliminate those charges, improve the access to care for their residents, shows that those deductions are having an effect. Do you have time for one more question? I thank everyone for their questions, um, but we also want to make sure that you guys have an opportunity to speak with each other one on one and have yeah, come coffee. and see us at the break. Yes, exactly. <laughs> We're all sticking around for a bit. So, uh, sir, go ahead with your question. Okay, please. sure. Thank you, uh, Ian Johnson from Nova Scotia. Just wanted to, uh, first of all, thank you both for the work you did and your division for uh, all the work that you've done. I'm wondering about the public reporting of the annual report. In other words, what steps are taken when you release the report to make it known that the report has come out and other provinces similarly do a similar process? In other words, in Nova Scotia, for example, we have the Nova Scotia Committee on Health, which is a all-party legislative committee. Do those committees try to also report on what you've come out with and what recommendations apply? So I think that public reporting, I think, is very important and should be part of the process. The annual report is released every year. It, it's tabled with the clerks of the House and the Senate, and it's uh, you know deposited with the committees. Um, I don't think there's a great amount in Parliament that happens after that, but we do have a social media campaign every year as well. Uh, we release uh, the report, you know, with as much uh, foo for as you can on an annual report, uh, you know, created by the federal government. Um, but we also, you know, because we tweet about it, the department tweets about it. Um, uh, we see it picked up by stakeholders like the Canadian Health Coalition the, and others who, um, you know, generally are highlighting the, the compliance work, frankly. I think this might be the first year, which is somewhat odd given it was the first year that it kind of outlined those deductions for diagnostics. I don't think we saw any media requests on the report this year for the very first time, which for us was a little bit odd because we thought it was kind of a, a big deal report. Um, and it was the first time it wasn't uh, highlighted by any media articles, I don't think. Um, so again, that's something that, you know, folks in this room, if you have read the report, even sharing it, and again, the Canada Health Coalition did share it on their website. They tweeted about it, which was you know, greatly appreciated. Because um, again, we, we spend a lot of time and effort, and it is a way to inform Canadians on, on how the provinces and territories are, are meeting the requirements of the Canada Health Act. I think that's also a lesson for, and I'll just speak from the media's perspective, about um, especially when there are annual reports on something. We are inundated with so much information that sometimes we forget what the nuggets are within something that is so predictable, comes out every single year at the same time, et cetera, et cetera. So um, with that, we will end the panel. Thanks to Jennifer and Lee for the amazing presentation. Yes, definitely. Let's clap. And thanks to you all. And I hope you enjoy the rest of the day.